Amen. Cody Westbrook, who was with us on the trip, as I was on medication to get better and was progressively getting better, he was getting worse. And he uh, had to speak close to the last uh, speaker on Sunday. So he was pretty bad at that point, feeling bad. And then we drove home. And then Tuesday, he had to go to Emory. They were having a gospel meeting where he went and preached there because they had all the, uh, the former preachers that they had supported in the schools of preaching come so he feeling very bad Tuesday had to drive to Emory and preach and then drive home to Oklahoma I talked to him today and he said he's just feeling so bad he's not even going to be able to go to Wednesday night service there at Ardmore Uh, so uh, he got progressively worse with his allergies as as I was was getting a little bit better but it was a rough uh, rough a week um, as far as trying to get over all these allergies that we're hitting. Psalm 68. It's a psalm of David in which he is uh, talking about the glory of God and His goodness to the nation of Israel. And as we look at some of these psalms, sometimes there's just a passage or two that deal with Jesus. Sometimes the whole psalm deals with Jesus, like Psalm 2. That whole psalm deals with Jesus. But this one only verse 18. Verse 17 and 18 to get the context. Psalm 68, verse 17 and 18. David says, The chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of thousands. The Lord is among them, as in Sinai, in the holy place. You have ascended on high. You have led captivity captive. You have received gifts among men, even from the rebellious that the Lord God might dwell there. So he's talking about God and using this imagery, this poetic imagery of an army, that God has uh, 20,000 chariots, even thousands of thousands. So the imagery there is a God who is a God of war, that he will go to war against his enemies. And he references back uh, the Lord as the one who is among them, as in Sinai, that's where the law of Moses was given, in the holy place. Then it says something about God. It says, you have ascended on high and led captivity captive. And you have received gifts among men, even from the rebellious, that the Lord God might dwell there. Well, if you hold your place in the Psalms and turn in your New Testament to Ephesians chapter 4, we have this verse directly quoted by Paul. Ephesians chapter 4. And he says in verse 7, after Ephesians 4 and verse 7, after he talks about the seven ones of unity and the importance of unity and those seven planks in the platform of unity, he says in verse 7, Ephesians 4 and verse 7, But to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Verse 8, Therefore he says... When he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. This is a quotation from Psalm 68 and verse 18. However, the difference is in verse 18 of Psalm 68, it says he received gifts from men. But Paul here records that he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now the question is, is he directly quoting it? If he's directly quoting it, why is he quoting it differently? And as I pondered that and looked at this, I think the most logical explanation of this is the same Holy Spirit that inspired Paul to write this is the same Holy Spirit that inspired David to write what he he wrote. And so what he's doing is he's taking this passage that refers to Jesus and saying it differently to teach a lesson. 
I mean, it's, his whole, it's the Holy Spirit scripture. He can quote it however he would like to quote it. He wrote it. He had the inspired writers write it. He had David write it. He had Paul write it. So he's saying it differently to get another point across. So I believe that's an explanation of that, why it says he received gifts among men in Psalm 68 and verse 18. And, but when it's quoted, it says he gave gifts to men. The Holy Spirit is getting another message across as he is quoting this verse. Now, what's he talking about the gifts there? We have to read further. Look at verse 9, Ephesians 4 and verse 9. Now, this he ascended. What does it mean but that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth? Now, back in Psalm 68, this is talking about God. As we bring this into the New Testament context, God, who ascended on high, first descended into the lower parts of the earth. Now, who would that be describing? Christ as God. Christ as God, before He ascended back to the Father, He descended into the lower parts of of the earth. Now verse 10 says of Ephesians 4, He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all and all. So the one who ascended, that David is talking about, first had to descend into the lower parts of the earth. Well, I believe that's a reference to when he died. His burial, his spirit going into the Hadean realm, which is sometimes depicted in the lower parts of the earth. And so this is Jesus' death. This is him ascending or descending before he ascended. He had to die on the cross before he ascended back to the Father. Now look at verse 11. What's he talking about the gifts here? What does this mean? Verse 11 explains this. Ephesians 4 and verse 11. He himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the working of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So the gifts that's being referred to in verse 8 are the spiritual gifts that he lists here in verse 11. These miraculous abilities that were given by the Holy Spirit through the laying on of whose hands? Apostles. Acts chapter 6, Acts chapter 8, and Acts chapter 19 prove that. Acts 6, Acts 8, Acts 19, through the laying on of the apostles' hands, others other than the apostles could receive spiritual gifts, miraculous gifts. So what we have here, and uh, we have these gifts that he, that he gave when he ascended on high and he led captivity captive. He freed men. He freed men by his resurrection from the dead. And he gave gifts to men. Specifically, the gifts are the spiritual gifts as listed there in verse 11 of Ephesians 4, apostles. Those were the ones who were eyewitnesses of Jesus Christ. Some prophets, those would be the ones on whom the apostles laid their hands. They would be the ones who were the inspired preachers. And then you have evangelists and pastors and teachers. The pastors there refer to the elders. The elders are the pastors. In fact, this is the only time the word pastors is found in the New Testament in the noun form, in reference to the elders. The evangelist is not the pastor, unless the evangelist is one of the elders. If he's qualified to be a part of the eldership and he's one of the elders, then he can be an elder. But he is not a pastor because he preaches that's what the denominational world thinks that a preacher is a pastor but that's not it the pastors are the shepherds and they are the elders 
Now these miraculous gifts were given in the first century, verse 12, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, the edifying of the body. The church did not have a written New Testament Testament when it began in the year 33 A.D., approximately, in Jerusalem. It had living vessels that preached to them, apostles and prophets. Then as time went on from, from that first century period on, letters were written, gospel accounts were written that added up to 27. And then that was the end of it. That was the end of Scripture. That's why it says in verse 13, till we come to the unity of the faith. The unity of the faith there is the unity of what God wants revealed. Everything God wants, the complete revelation of God, that unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ. You can parallel this with 1 Corinthians chapter 13, where he talks about those spiritual gifts. Tongues, prophecy, knowledge, they're going to pass away. When that which is perfect is come, that which is in part will be done away. Those spiritual gifts are done away. We have the completed will of God in the Scripture. We can know God's will. The unity of the faith is the New Testament. That's why Jude verse 3 says, Contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all given to the saints. So we don't have the spiritual gifts today, but we have the product of the spiritual gifts. The apostles and the prophets wrote the New Testament. We don't have living apostles and prophets, but we have a living word that they wrote and it's been passed down to us. So even though we don't have these spiritual gifts today, we have what they produced, the word of God, which is the power of God and the salvation. Romans 1 and a verse 16. So this prophecy here in Psalm 68 and verse 18 refers to Jesus ascending back uh, to the Father. And we hadn't even really talked about that much concerning the actual event. Uh, look in Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16. Jesus ascended back to the Father. He did not stay on earth after His resurrection. Look at verse 19 and 20. Mark 16, verse 19 and 20. So then, this is after He gave the Great Commission, So then, after the Lord had spoken to them, He was received up into heaven. That's His ascension. Sat down at the right hand of God. And they, the apostles went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working through with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. So there's the uh, ascension of Christ mentioned there. Luke, uh, Luke chapter uh, 24, you have it mentioned again. Luke chapter 24. Verse 50. He led them out as far as Bethany. He lifted up his hands and he blessed them. Now it came to pass while he blessed them that he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to earth, or excuse me, returned to Jerusalem uh, with a great joy. So here you have Jesus ascending he blesses them and ascends and then they return to jerusalem with great joy and they continued in the temple praising and blessing god because he told them you stay in jerusalem till you receive this power power of the holy spirit so you have the ascension mentioned there again look at acts chapter 1 acts chapter 1 <coughs> Verse 9. Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfast toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who said also, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven, this same Jesus, 
who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. So there's the ascension of Jesus Christ. He had to ascend, and there's, there's a, really a whole other portion of, of this that we could go into. I preached a sermon several years ago about why Jesus ascended back to the Father. Why didn't he just stay on earth? Well, there's various reasons why. And one of those reasons is here in Psalm 68 and verse 18. It was prophesied he would ascend. But also he had to give those gifts unto men, the apostles, the prophets, those inspired men. And he had to ascend for that to happen. And there's other reasons. He had to ascend to rule over the spiritual kingdom, to be the head of the church. He had to ascend to be our high priest in heaven. So there's various reasons why he ascended back to the Father. And so we'll go on to our next uh, passage in the Psalms. Any questions or comments about this? Right. In the book of John, he said, if I don't leave you, the, the Holy Spirit will not come. So there, there, there is, there, that's one of many reasons that he gave for the reason why he, he needed to ascend back to heaven. It was prophesied in Daniel that he would, prophesied in Psalms here that he would. Uh, there was, the Holy Spirit had to come, but for the Holy Spirit to come, he had to ascend back. So there, there's various aspects of that. Yes. Do what now? Exactly. He couldn't be a high priest on earth. He couldn't function in that capacity because uh, the, the, the high priest had to be of Aaron and he was of the tribe of Judah. I mean, there are various aspects as to why he had to ascend back to the Father to... Uh, complete the process for the church to be established look at psalm 69 verse 9 this is a psalm of david in which there is an urgent plea that he's giving to god for help in trouble and he says there in a Beginning, let's go back to verse 5, kind of get the context. Psalm 69, verse 5. Oh God, you know my foolishness. My sins are not hidden from you. Let not those who wait for you, O Lord of hosts, be ashamed because of me. Let not those who seek you be confounded because of me, O God of Israel. Because for your sake I have borne reproach. Shame has covered my face. I have become a stranger to my brothers and an alien to my mother's children, because of zeal for your house has eaten me up, and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. So here you have something that is uh, very interesting. This is about David, and it's, and it's one of those passing uh, references to Christ. But the zeal for the house of God has eaten him up. Well, turn in your New Testament to John chapter 2. John chapter 2. John chapter 2. Here in the context of verse 17... Well, let's go back up to verse 13 to get the full context. Jesus is going to cleanse the temple for the first time. This is the beginning of his ministry. He does it twice. This is the beginning of his ministry, and he's cleansing the temple the first time. Now, the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to to Jerusalem. And he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and money changers and doing business. When he had made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen, and he poured out the money changers and the overturned the tables, verse 16. 
And he said to those who sold doves, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Verse 17. Then his disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house has eaten me up. That is a reference back to Psalm 69 and verse 9. When they saw that, and they saw the fervor of Jesus, Jesus didn't lose control. He was in perfect control the whole time he did this. It was calculated. It was on purpose. But it wasn't sinful. I know some people today would look at that and say, oh, he lost control. He, he sinned there. He, he got angry. Well, yes, he was angry. And he was rightfully angry. But he didn't sin. He had authority to do what he did to cleanse that temple because he was the son of God. And they remembered the scripture, zeal for your house has eaten me up. He was eaten up with zeal. Now, what is zeal? Passion. That's, that's a good word for it. Passion, dedication, commitment. It is a word that denotes uh, excitement. It is a word that also, it's, it's really in a very emotional word to denote when you're excited about something, you're passionate about something, and, and Jesus was passionate about keeping the temple pure and keeping the temple functioning for what it was intended to be. And that's why he drove out those money changers and he made a whip and he drove them all out, overturned their tables. You know, we as Christians should have a zeal and a passion for serving God and keeping the church functioning the way the New Testament teaches us the church should function. And not allow unscriptural innovations, unscriptural programs, unscriptural things to come into the church and burden the church from its purpose. The church, the, the temple's purpose was not to be a flea market. And that's what it turned into. And he was saying, this is not the purpose. This is a house of prayer. And he says, you've made it a house of merchandise. Well, the Lord's house, the church today, is not a house of entertainment. It's not a house of, you just fill in the blank, what brethren want to do. And we need to be zealous for the Lord's work and, and be passionate about it as he, he was zealous for that temple. And uh, they remembered that scripture concerning him. Now there is another part of this scripture, Psalm 69 and verse 9, where it says, Because zeal for your house has eaten me up, and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me, that portion is found in Romans chapter 15, and verse 3. Romans chapter 15. Look at verses 1 through 3 to get the context. Paul is writing about bearing one another's burdens and helping out the brethren who are weak. He says, We then who are strong ought to bear the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves. That each of us please his neighbor for his good leading to edification. For even Christ did not please himself. For it is written, The reproaches of those who reproach you fell on me. That's the last part of Psalm 69 and verse 9. Christ didn't come to please himself, but he came to bear reproach, to bear our sins. Our reproaches of others fell upon him. He became the sin bearer. So, in that sense, that... Jesus bore our sins is exactly uh, what we find here in Psalm 69 and verse 9. The reproaches of those who reproach you fell on me. The point is, Jesus did not go about trying to please himself. He went about doing the Lord's will and taking upon himself the burden of others to help others out. Jesus was willing to bear our burden of reproach so that we could be saved. He bore our reproach. 
So we have to have that same attitude towards our brothers and sisters who are weak, who do not know the scriptures in certain areas. They may be babes in Christ, and therefore we need to, uh, to help them out. Now, Psalm 69, the same psalm, look at verse 21. Verses 19 through 21 to get the context. Psalm 69, verses 19 through 21. David says, You know my reproach, my shame, and my dishonor. My adversaries are all before you. Reproach has broken my heart, and I am full of heaviness. I look for someone to take pity, but there was none. And for comforters, but I found none. They also gave me gall for food, for my food, and for... And for my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink. For my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink. Turn to John chapter 19, when Jesus was on the cross. John chapter 19. Verse 28, this is towards the end of Jesus on the cross. Notice what it says, After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on hyssop, and put it to his mouth. And so when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. They, for his thirst, they gave him vinegar or sour wine to drink. Something that was not very quenching for the thirst. It was part of the torture to give someone that was thirsty something like that. But Jesus... Notice Jesus in in indescribable pain and agony. He was still concerned about all the scriptures being fulfilled concerning him. The attention to detail was on the mind of Christ when he was bearing the sins of the whole human race and was in, in undescribable pain and agony. He knew that his end was coming, that the scriptures might be fulfilled. He wanted every scripture about him fulfilled. And that's why he said, I thirst. And so Psalm 69 and verse 21 was fulfilled when that happened. So you see Jesus here being very concerned about the detail of scripture being fulfilled. It is not a shame. It is not being legalist. It is not being... uh, a Pharisee, as we're accused of, to be concerned about the details and following the Scripture. Jesus was. He was concerned about the details of fulfilling Scripture on the cross. That's our example. We should be very concerned about the details and doing things correctly. Now, Let's turn to Psalm 89. We have several in Psalm 89. This is a psalm by a man named Ethan, the Ezraite. Ethan, the Ezraite, wrote this psalm. And this has to do with him looking back on the covenant that was made Uh, to David concerning what would be in the future for David as far as his descendants were concerned. Uh, Psalm 89, beginning in verse 1, verses 1 through 4. Ethan says here, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known your faithfulness to all generations. For I have said mercy shall be built up forever. Your faithfulness... you shall establish in the very heavens. Verse 3, I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn to my servant David 
Your seed I will establish forever and build up your throne to all generations. So this is God speaking through Ethan, who's writing this down. And God made a covenant with his chosen one, David, swore to him that uh, of his seed it would be established forever and build a throne to all generations. Now, let's look at verse 34 because it still relates to that. Verse 34 through 37. Psalm 89, verse 34. My covenant I will not break nor alter the word that has gone out of my lips. Once I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. His seed, verse 36, shall endure forever and his throne as the sun before me. It shall be established forever like the moon, even like the faithful witness in the sky. So God is speaking again through Ethan, and he is saying, uh, speaking of this covenant that was made to David. He says it's as sure to happen as the sun and the moon are in the sky. It's going to happen. That throne is going to be established. So we have this promise made to David. And there's other psalms that deal with the promise uh, made to David. But we need to look at the initial promise made to David. So turn to 2 Samuel chapter 7. 2 Samuel chapter 7. Who was the first king of Israel? Was he a good king or a bad king? Kind of a trick question because he was good at first and then went bad. He was good at first and then went bad. David was chosen to replace him. It's interesting you read in 2 Samuel chapter 2 that there was someone of the house of Saul, Ashibosheth, I think his name is, who reigned for two years. He wasn't an authorized king. But he reigned for two years and he made war with David, who was the legitimate king in the house of Judah. So there was a little bit of a civil war that went on there during that period of time. 2 Samuel chapter 2. But then he was defeated. And the legitimate king, David, was ruling. Well, there was a promise made to David. You remember that David wanted to build what? Temple. David wanted to build the temple. And Nathan the prophet said, yeah, that's great, go ahead. And God spoke to Nathan and said, no, I didn't authorize this. Remember, we had a sermon a few weeks ago about that. Just because someone thinks something's a good idea doesn't mean it's from God. And so, God speaks to David and tells him, makes a covenant with him, and tells him that, yes, one of your seed will build the temple. It has an immediate fulfillment in Solomon who builds the actual temple. But it foreshadows and prophesies about the coming of the ultimate descendant of David, Jesus, and the ultimate temple, which is the church, the church of Christ. So we have an immediate fulfillment in his immediate descendant Solomon, but then there's going to be an ultimate fulfillment in Jesus Christ and the church. Now look at 2 Samuel 7, verse 12. He's talking to David, God is. When your days were fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, what does that mean? When you die, your days are fulfilled, you rest with your fathers. I will set up your seed after you who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. So here's the initial promise, covenant, made by God to David that is spoken of in Psalm 89. Psalm 89 is just in poetry, talking about that covenant that was made. 
And he goes on to say in verse 14, I will be his father. He shall be my son. If he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the blows of the sons of men. But my mercy shall not depart from him, verse 15, as I took it from Saul, whom I removed from before you, verse 16, and your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. That's exactly what we read about in Psalm 89. It's going to be as sure as the sun in the sky and the moon in the sky. So in verse 17, it says, According to all these words and according to all the visions, so Nathan spoke to David. So this message was given to Nathan the prophet, and Nathan gave it to King David. So we have here a fulfillment that's going to take place with Solomon. Solomon would be the one who builds the temple. Solomon's throne would be established. Solomon's ruling family, dynasty, would be established. And all the kings of the southern kingdom were of the house of David. Every single one of them were descendants of David. Not all of them were good. In fact, very few of them were good kings. Josiah, Asa, Hezekiah, there's a few good ones in there. But they were all descendants of King David. And even when the people went into Babylonian captivity, that seed line was still preserved. And then they came home from 70 years of Babylonian captivity, were reestablished in the land, that seed line was still preserved. All the way up until the New Testament period of time with Joseph and Mary. That's why those genealogies are in the New Testament tracing the lineage of Jesus. Because of this promise made to King David. Both Joseph, the earthly father of Jesus, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, were descendants of King David. But far enough apart to where they could get married. Distant, distant, distant cousins. But they were both Descended from King David. So the fulfillment has its ultimate fulfillment in uh, Jesus Christ. And God was working that providentially throughout the centuries to bring Jesus into the world. Now, turn to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, uh, verse uh, 26. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to the city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, considering what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Behold, you will conceive in your womb, bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. Verse 32. He will be great. He will be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. Throne there represents authority. Authority to rule. It's not a literal chair. Not a literal thing you sit down on. It's referring to being able to rule. He's going to have the authority to rule. Verse 33, He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. The house of Jacob and the kingdom, both, when you read the rest of the New Testament, is referring to the church. Because the church is spiritual Israel. There's a circumcision of Christ that takes place. When does that happen? 
when we're baptized. Colossians chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. Circumcision of Christ. We become spiritual Israel. So when this one who is a descendant of King David is born and grows up, he'll have authority to rule. Verse 34. Then Mary said uh, to the angel, How can this be since I do not know a man? She's saying, I'm a virgin. The angel answered and said, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, the Holy One who is born to you shall be called the Son of God. In other words, this is not going to be a natural conception. The Holy Spirit is going to come upon him or upon her, and she is going to miraculously conceive. This has never happened before, and it will never happen again. This is unique. Verse 36. Now indeed Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age, and this is now the sixth month of her who was called barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. That's talking about John the Baptist, who was a cousin of Jesus. Because Mary and Elizabeth were related. So here you have the ultimate fulfillment, and you see here that he would be born by the power of the Holy Spirit so that he would rule on David's throne over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom there shall be no end. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 13 tells Christians they have been translated out of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear Son. And we know that the church and the kingdom are the same because Jesus, when he talked about the church in Matthew 16 and verse 18, the very next verse, he referred to it as the kingdom. Verse 19. Jesus said in John 3 and verse 5, you had to be born again of water and the Spirit to enter the kingdom. The same thing is being spoken of here. So all this has to do with us. It all has to do with every Christian from the time of the first century. Ultimately fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Okay, next week, Lord willing, we will go into some passages that are found in... If you want to write this down and read this ahead of time, I did look ahead for this month a little bit. Psalm 110. Psalm 110. Read that entire psalm, and there are some prophecies about Jesus in that psalm. Psalm 110, and we'll look at it next week, Lord willing.